I want to thank Karen and the courthouse for pulling us together tonight and, and especially to Karen and the courthouse also for representing my work that uh, the sale of my work on exhibit that she mentioned at the Blum Gallery at the College of the Atlantic. So um, I hope you all can possibly get a chance to see it if you're willing to fight the crowds on Mount Desert right now. It's, it's pretty overwhelming. But um, let's see, we got all light. Yeah, it's as dark as we can get. So I hope they'll look all right. They're a little washed out because of the, the ambient light in the room. And, uh, but this really is about a birthday party. And it, you're all aware of Acadia's birthday, but it's also the birthday of the National Park System, which is a very big deal. And, uh, and then there's my little birthday of our book. So it's, it's a triple header that we're, we're celebrating tonight. And I want to take you through some of that and, and uh, kind of give you a, a background again of, of Acadia. And uh, as many of you know, Acadia was the first national park east of the Mississippi. And many people consider it really the only ma national park in the entire Northeast. I think technically that may not be true, but it's certainly our major park in the Northeast. But before this, really, all the national parks were Western, you know, celebrating the, the great geology, the dramatic landscape, the huge scale, the monumental power of these places out west, like Yosemite, Rocky Mountain National Park. And Arcadia Mountains really appealed to those very same sensibilities. Um, they were just in miniature. And that miniature element makes it the fifth smallest park in the entire national park system at almost 50,000 acres, uh, including private easements as well. So, I mean, to put it in perspective, you could fit 44 Acadias into Yellowstone National Park. So, the bulk of those 50,000 acres, and again, most of you know all this, but if I don't trip here, but uh, yeah, the bulk of those 50,000 acres are right here on Mount Desert Island. Uh, and the park comprises about half the island. And then if we go down the coast here, we've got Isla Ho at just under 3,000 acres, roughly, I believe. And then up the coast here, Skudik Peninsula with around 2,400 acres. So that, those are the three major units plus small islands that, uh, that comprise the park. So yet despite this small size, it's one of our top 10 national parks. And last year broke a record uh, with almost 2.7 million visitors. So it makes it one of the highest numbers, people numbers per area of any national park in the system. And somewhat is no surprise, this year's figures are up 20% uh, with it fully on track to break 3 million visitors is the way it looks now. So I mean most of you again are familiar with Acadia but I, I want to kind of review what we've got here. And within the park it's a dizzying diversity of habitats um, and I think clearly the most conspicuous spectacular feature are the mountains right down to the sea. You've got 26 peaks, um, eight of which are over a thousand feet in height. Surrounded by the sea, Acadia has mile upon mile of granite shoreline. I mean Mount Desert in a maybe a generous sense, is about 14 by 18 miles, and yet it's, it contains roughly 75 miles of coastline. So it's a lot of coast in a small package. And uh, most of that shore is subjected to big tides and powerful surf. And when those tides retreat, they reveal subtle and complex tide pools uh, really a whole separate microcosm brimming with life. Large sections of the coast are rimmed by granite cliffs, some over a hundred feet tall. Here you're, you're seeing Raven Cliff on the Skudik Peninsula. 
And the island itself of Mount Desert is dotted all over with ponds and lakes, uh, most of them running north and south between these steep, uh, steep walled mountain ridges. And these ponds and lakes provide critical freshwater habitat, really in very close juxtaposition to the ocean. Again, stretching this diversity of habitat in such a small area. And then there are many beautiful marsh and meadow wetlands that border these freshwater and upper tidal zones. I love walking and wading into these areas. It's a great landscape. Bogs are scattered throughout the park and, and host a myriad of carnivorous plants like sundew and uh, pitcher plants. Streams flow through most of the valleys, offering these temporal waterfalls off the ledges. You know, especially after we get substantial rains and, and they shed off these the impervious granite surfaces. And boy, we need some of that now. I've hardly ever seen the park so dry. Acadia has more than 125 miles of hiking trails, um, countless with commanding views of the sea and the outer islands. And yes, this is a trail. It's the Jordan Cliffs Trail, which is not really for the faint of heights, but, but very dramatic anyway. It's one of my favorites. So how did this story of Acadia begin? Um, well, it started with a, a handful of uh, key players, among them Charles Eliot, who was then president of Harvard University. And Eliot's son worked for Frederick Olmsted, who is, many of you know, considered the, the father of landscape architecture. And uh, among his claims of which he uh, designed New York Central Park. But Eliot's son loved Mount Desert, and, uh, but sadly he died at the young age of 38. So his father took on the preservation dream in his son's honor. Another principal and very familiar name to many of us is George Dorr, who was originally just a summer cottager, and he became obsessed with saving the area. So for 25 years, he put all his time and all his fortune into land protection, all in the ultimate goal of building Acadia. Dorr ultimately died blind and poor, but he was instrumental in establishing the park. And it's really fair to say, I think, that Acadia would not exist were it not for the efforts of George Dorr. And if you want to dig deeper, there's a new book by Ron Epp, uh, the biography of George Dorr, that has just come out. And the third key player was John D. Rockefeller Jr. And, uh, and he loved the beauty and the tranquility of Mount Desert, and as a result gave millions in support of George Dorr's effort. And in addition to financial Philanthropy, uh, Rockefeller also gave about 10,000 acres and built the carriage road system and these monumental stone bridges that you see here that, that overpass almost all the streams uh, in the park. So these three men, they, they were true visionaries and uh, they devoted all their efforts for the public benefit you know, versus creating a private enclave, which they so easily could have done to kind of protect their own turf. And so the result was Acadia became the first park created entirely from donated land. A, a, really a remarkable achievement with no impact to the taxpayer whatsoever. Ken Olson, uh, one of the essay authors of our book, states that publicly owned Acadia would not exist without privately won wealth. So with the centennial, um, reflecting on the past reveals testimony to the remarkable impact, I think, of these individuals on conservation. And, you know, even today, in a different era, we can't ignore or forget what a few can achieve for conservation and the environment because they did it, they pulled it off. 
But well before the park, backtracking now a little bit, you know, as word spread about this singular place, uh, among the first to arrive were the early painters, Thomas Cole in 1844, Frederick Church, and others of the Hudson River School. And you know, again, this was at, at a time when the natural landscape was part of our nationalism, our identity, and even our religion. So remember, this was occurring during the same period you know, as the great discoveries were happening in the American West. So the country at the time embraced the concept that nature, and I mean nature really with a capital N, embodied the sublime, and that nature fostered a higher sense of morality. And as people in cities became aware of these artists' dramatic renderings, so the very first wave of true visitors began. And these early rusticators, as they were called, evolved into the cottagers with their summer homes. So initially the island was called Ile des Monts Désert, or Island of the Barren Mountains, because most of the peaks are these wide open granite balls that we all know so well. But in 1916, a hundred years ago, it officially became Sir de Mont National Monument from only about 5,000 acres. It was just a seedling bit of land that kicked it off. And then the, the true transition to a national park didn't occur until about 1919, when it was named Lafayette National Park for the Frenchman who served under George Washington uh, during the American Revolution. In 1929, the park expanded yet again, and its name changed this time to Acadia National Park. Acadia was derived from the word Lacadie, which was the French translation of the Abenaki Native American word, which simply stood for the place. Lacadie, the place of sacred meaning and power. To put it in perspective, Ken Olson says of Acadia in our book that it's a century old in law, but at least 420 million years old by the clock. The focal point of Acadia is Cadillac Mountain. It's the highest point on the eastern seaboard between Newfoundland and Rio de Janeiro. So think about that, zoom out and just imagine that whole eastern shoreline all the way from Newfoundland to the Olympics. Uh, extraordinary stretch of coast. But the glacier sculpted the granite into bare open summits and ridges. To the point now where it's a journey to the summit of Cadillac to see sunrise has become almost a mandatory pilgrimage for all visitors. Because that very first light of dawn kisses its summit from October to March. I think the rest of the year Lubeck makes that claim, but uh, Acadia kind of gets the, the full credit. I mentioned to you the, the carriage roads of John D. Rockefeller. The, there are 45 miles of them coursing through the park with beautiful crushed gravel surfaces and these amazing stone bridges, again, over almost every stream. It's one of the unique features of the park, without doubt. And uh, uh, lakes and ponds abound throughout Acadia and MDI, and there's a total of about 26 of them, all glacially scoured out, uh, many in this north-south orientation. Uh, a few as deep as 150 feet, uh, which is, as you see here in uh, Jordan Pond, there are over 40 named streams, uh, all very rain dependent, and uh, either flowing into these lakes or ponds, or a rare few directly into the ocean is seen here in Man War Brook, uh, spilling into the fjord of Somme Sound. But MDI and Acadia are a major birding destination with over about 330 species of birds. Uh, here you see merlins, perched on the shore of Eagle Lake. An American red start takes flight. A northern Perula warbler. And in peak migration, uh, there have been counts of 23 species of warbler on the island. 
And Ed Hawks, who's in our audience tonight, is the consummate birder here, so he can correct me on any of this, but I think I'm close. Uh, here a male yellow-rumped warbler. Uh, Rubig-throated hummingbird feeds in a meadow of Rodora blossoms. Uh, this meadow is fantastic in the spring and it's located in Great Meadow behind the Sir de Mont Wild Acadia Gardens. And I really waded out there to photograph the Rodora and found myself surrounded by dozens and dozens of hummingbirds. It was an amazing spectacle. Uh, here a great blue heron takes flight along the shore of Little Long Pond. An Atlantic puffin seen on the ocean off of Acadia. Even the ubiquitous herring gulls provide an interesting subject for me along the shore. Chris Camuto, who wrote the wonderful book Time and Tide in Acadia, writes in his essay in our book, MDI is a granite book of ours, a place to enjoy the nature of nature and to meditate on the great evolving fact of nature. Well, if I have a favorite bird in Acadia, this is it, the common loon. And yeah, it's Maine's signature bird, but for a very good reason, because it's in most of our lakes and ponds, uh, not only in Acadia, but throughout the state. And the bulk of my images are taken from kayak early in the morning when the waters are calm. And the birds dive for usually around a minute, but they can stay under for up to 10 minutes. So my usual approach is to be conspicuous, but conspicuous at a distance, and then gradually paddle closer while they pursue their normal behavior. And I, I simply just let them get used to me, which they usually do. And they dive and feed in a certain orientation. So I'll take note of that. And when they're underwater, I'll paddle like crazy in the same direction, trying to converge with where I think they'll pop up. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit cartoonish, if you remember the old Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny cartoons where, where he's chasing that wily rabbit down the holes. And, but suddenly the loon pops up, and hello, there we both are, and I get my photo opportunity. But I'll read their behavior patterns, and they, they usually, you know, they transition through different sequences of feeding, loafing, wing stretching. And it's, it's wonderful to spend time with them. And you, you all know the vocalizations that are unique and haunting and beautiful. But they're, they're such a primal part of our, our soundscape here. And yet, it's almost become the Hollywood cliche of bird calls to the point where, and I'll bet you birders have noticed this, where you often hear loons calling in movies in places that are forever loonless. <laughs> but for me, it's best at night lying in bed and one will fly, happen to fly over calling in the night. It's just gorgeous. This is one of my favorite photos just for its serenity, its elegant grace of the loon preening. And uh, here there's a loon on the nest. This was just a few weeks ago. And uh, I got a tip from Sally Arata, who's right here, that a loon was on a nest on Jordan Pond. And I raced out, got this photograph, and then literally two days, three days later, this is what I encountered. And, and I'd always wanted to get a photo. It's, this classic photograph of the young riding on the parent's back. And there they were. And I spent several hours with them and it was a beautiful sight to see that just like little kids, they'd clamor and complain and, and then the parents would come in and feed them and then they'd struggle to get up on the back and just within minutes the heads would start drooping, drooping and they'd be completely out cold riding on the parent's back. Great sight. But the, the, here you've got a, a, an, older, an older chick, but the parents are very protective and keep the young close by and, and uh, often between myself and the chick. 
The loons are also extremely territorial to the point where the males will battle each other, which is what's going on here. This male is threatening another who's coming too close or into his territory. And I read that it, they even, in these battles, result in the death of one of them up to a third of the time. So it's serious business. Every spring, a, a very dramatic migration occurs as alewives come from the sea to spawn in fresh water. And this was once Maine's most abundant migratory fish, uh, related to herring. But their numbers have plummeted due to dams, overfishing, pollution. They used to journey up the streams all along our coast here and were a major source of bait for lobster traps. But everything eats alewives. So with them comes this congregation of predators, which is what I enjoy. And uh, so the ospreys are constantly hovering over the stream mouths where the alewives are congregating before rushing upstream. Uh, they get a, a laser lock on their target and hear that the dive is just commencing. And then it becomes a, an aerial acrobatic dive that's almost straight down. They hit the water feet first, feet first, talons out. And this one had a near miss that you see here. But it kept at it, and then a few minutes later, he was successful. But this success uh, varies hugely individually between different birds. But you can imagine, once you've got that fish in your talons, you're handicapped. Flying's a struggle. And uh, so there's, a, there's often a pecking order reversal where the hangers on will a, a, actually attack the, the more alpha birds, and try and get them to drop their prey. This guy clearly may have taken more than he could swallow. <laughs> so that while all this is going on, the harbor seals are launching submarine attacks in the shallows and coming right in where there's almost no water. And uh, this innocent bystander wandered out while I was there wondering what all the action was about. But the ever watchful eagles are here too. And they're, you know, they're waiting for their chance to get in the game. Only they're lazy. And uh, so they tend not to make the catch themselves, but prefer to steal it from unsus the unsuspecting osprey. And they'll take off in hot pursuit. But again, here you've got that role reversal of any, any chance to pick on the alpha predator where this, uh, this eagle's being pursued here, even without any fish. But this, this great theater with the alewives, to me, represents one of the defining elements of, of Acadia. You know, it, it symbolizes the interconnections of land and sea and humans, you know, as it plays out this, this ongoing drama of predator and prey. Not everyone wants their photo taken. <laughs> I understand. So it's hard to look at it. Well, you, you kind of cued me there a little bit. But it is hard to look at this without going, oh, so cute, adorable, cuddly. And, and the, my point is, we, we can't help but assign our emotions to the subject. And yet anthropomorphism you know, really gets a bad rap in natural history because it's not scientific enough. Uh, we shouldn't let our emotions get in the way. You know, but, but I'd like to, obviously I'm emotionally driven, but I'd like to argue that, to the contrary that projecting our emotions into wildlife I think plays a critical role in our feeling connected with the natural world. And uh, argu arguably even sharing a consciousness. You know, on some levels our feelings and awareness must certainly overlap. Here's what you're seeing, swallowtail butterflies mobbing fresh otter scat, feeding on the uh, minerals in the otter scat. And I had been kayaking for a few hours and, and was stiff and needed a stretch. And I pulled up to this little island and there was a wet trail through the grass and right at the end of it, a fresh otter poop and these, it was a fantastic sight, these monarch, I mean, excuse me, swallowtail butterflies just started pouring in. And I spent the next hour on my belly. 
here are mink ventures out from coastal rocks. And I mean, this was totally unexpected. That was the last thing in the world I imagined. Uh, but I love these spontaneous moments. I mean, it's, they're the surprises, you know. But I have to stay alert, I have to be ready. And a lot get away. But this buck suddenly emerged from the forest early in the morning while I was taking landscapes. Peregrine falcon, which for me is really the, the holy grail of birds here. And uh, you know, at one point they disappeared from Acadia altogether. But there's been successful reintroduction with about two to three nests a year now. And it's a superb example of the rewilding of Acadia, you know, where they were once gone and now humans have brought them back. That we can actually make some progress in some of these areas. I'm fascinated with tide pools. I mean, I just, they have such a myriad of life forms and abstract patterns, kind of otherworldly in appearance. Mussels and barnacles on algae covered rock uh, here, all photographed through shallow water. Dog whelks and barnacles exposed at low tide. With 10 foot daily tides, you know, life here is adapted to harsh extremes of inundation and exposure. So there's always that, that coastal drama of these tide pools. The granite shoreline itself becomes a palette of color and pattern with abstract reflections taken from my kayak. On close inspection, the rocks and granite are often infused with minerals that leach out in these intricate patterns. And some of these render beautiful colors and abstract designs, you know, especially when it's, the rock is high in iron, as you see here. Surface lichens adorn pink granite. Lichen on granite again in an almost cosmic explosion. A sea-run brook trout displays its own cosmic pattern. Night photography represents a whole new opportunity with digital. So, so now we can capture the night sky as never before. You just couldn't do it with film in the same way. Uh, here you're looking up to the Milky Way. And it's a difficult challenge technically, and I'm, I'm actually not very good at it, but I'm, I'm trying to get better. And uh, this is a star, ta star trail time lapse here of about one hour that you're seeing. And this was probably my most successful time lapse on a crystal clear spring night. And you're seeing the stars rotating around the North Star in about a four hour exposure. So one night I was trying to photograph uh, a meteor shower and I had the camera going most of the night and I, I fell asleep right at the edge of the shore on Little Long Pond and, uh, and suddenly there was this pow right next to me and I, I literally thought a gun had gone off and I shined my light around and there he was, my night stalker, a beaver. And, uh, I think he was fully as surprised to see me as I, as I him and warned me with a big slap of his tail. So I, I was going by one of the ponds in winter and I'd seen these openings in the ice and I was actually looking for landscape reflections in the open water when suddenly out popped this beaver and began grooming. But it was, it was a great view of, of that big broad tail and again, just one of those serendipitous moments when you least expect it. Winter in Acadia. Winter averages about 61 inches of snow in Acadia, but that snow is very sporadic uh, with the tempering effect of the sea. So it's very hit or miss for me coming up on the winter trips. But I love winter in the park because the place is almost empty. You know, there's this wonderful atmosphere of solitude and quiet. And uh, many of the roads are closed to vehicles. The cross-country skiers 
love the carriage roads which are groomed just for them and for me that was that's been one of the winter highlights and and I've worked from snowshoes skis uh, crampons it's difficult to get around with all the gear but it's it's so worth it for that different that different view that different weather the winter especially serves as a brief reminder I think that once this this area was covered by glaciers some of them over a, a kilometer thick completely embedded in ice sometimes the only sound to break the silence is the cracking and groaning of ice on the lakes and ponds Jordan Pond is partially frozen here but not enough to support the ice fishermen who drag their huts out on skids until the spring thaw so with photography there's always the one image that eludes you and I'd come up in the winter and I'd heard that there were several snowy owls on the mountaintops <coughs> excuse me but we had a massive amount of snow and it was just too difficult and too deep to get up there with all my gear so Ed Hawks who's with us tonight said well I got a report there was one at the airport so this is taken about a half a mile away practically at the uh, at the Bar Harbor Airport but it was my first snowy owl sighting so it was, it was a big event for me and thanks to Ed but it's probably no surprise that that my favorite season of all is autumn with its vibrant hues its dynamic weather and the, the mountains create these beautiful reflections in all the ponds the peak and in intensity differs each year and kind of a hit or miss dance of timing the cliffs take on their own patterns of color like a great wall canvas um, here you see the famed precipice on Champlain Mountain but the visitor profile is different in the park in the fall it's it's older folks the kids are in school and I, I just find they're much more interactive with the landscape and more more sensitive to what's going on around them you know hiking biking horseback riding and autumn is also when most of uh, we photographers show up so without fail I always run into friends and colleagues to the point where it's almost become a, a homecoming of sorts where we share the energy of inspiration the subtle details are, are vibrant like these pitcher plants deep in a bog Acadia like most national parks is not without its problems you know it's it's suffered a decade of underfunding tourism has brought traffic and human congestion to many parts of the park and that's now throughout much of the year I mean just this July 4th weekend they had to close Cadillac Mountain three times because of gridlock it, it literally was chaos at the summit and this is the scene where I found myself at a classic sunset view once so it, it really raises the question of how many photographers does it take to photograph a sunset <laughs> so but MDI is ass assaulted by cruise ships and mansions going up on pieces of land surrounding the park cruise ship visitation has increased 300 percent in the last decade and this strikes really close to home for me home being Charleston South Carolina because it's our most divisive issue in my 35 years of living there are the cruise ships the prevailing problems are really urban problems in Acadia drugs traffic misbehavior and yet relative to our earth's history we've only been around for about 25 minutes and yet look at the impact we've unleashed on our habitats and, and, and the paradox of our national parks is that we've preserved this hallowed ground but truly to use the cliche we are loving it to death and that goes for many of the parks and uh, if it were not for groups like friends of Acadia you know who raise major funds to support the park and conduct numerous park projects Acadia and many of our other national parks would would simply no longer be viable these friends groups keep a lot of these major parks going so I mean for example Acadia gets less than half its budget from the federal government 
less than half. So the, the rest is coming from the private sector uh, through, again, organizations like Friends of Acadia. So since this geographic timeline is, is really beyond our comprehension, we instead tend to embrace the human timeline. And in this respect, I, I realize I've been knocking around Acadia for really over half my lifespan to date. So in a way, that makes me feel old. But the good news is it also keeps me young and it keeps me going. And that's what I love about it. So uh, my, my intent here is not to reflect on the past, but to, and, and this is, applies to the photography, but it's to deal with the here and now and the motivating power of the moment and of the experience. Now, I've had this wonderful privilege of working with an exceptional team on this book, Rizzoli Publishers, Friends of Acadia, in partnership with our sponsors. And uh, I feel very lucky indeed because every photographer would give their eye teeth to have a project like this. And it, it came about as the culmination of years of exploring Acadia. There, there are no shortcuts. You know, pursuing those special moments and places to the extent that ultimately I kind of intuitively knew when and where to be. So my, my visual objective was to create a sense of place, you know, to capture Acadia's timeless, spontaneous, and sacred moments. To evoke a feeling of deep time as dictated by its primal rhythms of weather, tides, and seasons. Photography is a dialogue. It's a negotiation with the natural world. And uh, as a result, I approach it with the mindset of a hunter-gatherer. And, uh, and some of those quests are intensely target-specific. You know, and as I said, others are just serendipitous. But engaging my body in the landscape, I think, heightens the senses in the mind's eye. And much of it, frankly, is just revealed through sweat and physical contact with this rugged terrain. So the, the very simple doing of hiking, paddling, becomes the reward in itself, the enlightenment, even above and beyond using the camera. So our mission in nature should be to engage with all capacities, to forge a connection between oneself and the landscape. I think it's more important to notice than to know wherein our curiosity is quite often more important than knowledge itself. And that skill is in simply noticing. I mean, nature just is. It, you know, it doesn't demand a faith or an orthodoxy. It just is. Chris Camuto writes in our book, we turn to the classic landscape to be in the presence of the great forces of nature out of which our own nature, especially our curiosity and consciousness, evolved. He continues, we are reminded at every turn that art comes from nature. Nothing is more sustainable than an aesthetic response to nature. Slow down, ob observe, appreciate, protect, as David MacDonald writes. So my photographic goal is to render the common as uncommon. To express the joy that somehow nature is still working in all its complexity. And to convey nature in its broadest spectrum, both as vulnerable and delicate, and as monumental and powerful as when Hurricane Bill, as you see here, ravaged our coast. The Acadia of today may be far from a true wilderness, but to the extent that consciousness is simply being aware, Acadia offers us the opportunity to feel wild and be conscious at a higher level. Dayton Duncan writes in our book, every national park represents a pact between generations, a gift outright from one generation to the next gift and obligation. 
The geography of philanthropy, Ken Olson calls it, the geography of philanthropy without which the park would not exist because philanthropy itself assigns a higher value. We borrow from the present, but we give for the future. For well over a century, people have gathered at Acadia in celebration of place. They keep coming back year after year, generation after generation, seeking, seeking those shared experiences. My wife, Lynn's family, is one of those, uh, going back to 1900. And these women here, three generations strong, and we in-law tag-alongs, uh, join forces every single year. And I have no doubt that my daughter and her generation uh, will carry on the tradition. Our days revolve around interacting with the land and the sea. That's why we're here. But as I hike, paddle, and photograph, I run into many folks from the campgrounds, the bed and breakfast, the inns, and they too have been coming to Acadia for years. On this centennial of our national park system, the very cover of National Geographic stated, a park protected once is not protected forever. We tend to take them for granted. So Acadia's status as a top 10 national park, you know, it may justify its existence as public land, but it doesn't necessarily secure its integrity as viable natural habitat. Acadia exemplifies nature as a destination but nature is all around us, and yet somehow we've grown disconnected. Our national parks have become symbolic islands in it that we seek out in a sea of development and civilization. We need to adopt an island mentality, uh, uh, call it an island state of mind, where its very finiteness fosters a more nurturing commitment wherein we perceive it as a fragile terrestrial arc. Simply put, we need wildness to realize there's something wild within us. The very act of engaging with the landscape makes us feel connected, which makes us feel caring, such that wherever we are becomes the place, as the Abenaki Indians called Acadia. Um, I'd like to close by reading to you a, a brief passage I wrote in our book. When I'm enveloped in Acadia, when the sun is just rising over tide pools and not another soul is around, yes, I own that moment. Yet it's the accumulation of these experiences that matters more, because that sense of ownership then transcends to a sense of belonging and to the discovery that we, as individuals, are inseparable from place and fully bound to it. The enlightenment of person by place is the baptism of Acadia. My goal is not just to reveal Acadia, but to affirm a sensuous shared vision, a connection to Acadia that stirs us to, to discover our own wildness there. And that wildness, in turn, will empower us to demonstrate that we are somehow worthy of our landscape. So, I thank you for sharing the evening with me. And uh, these were the generous sponsors who made all of this project possible and my exhibition. David Rockefeller and the Shelby Davis Charitable Fund. And uh, hats off to my authors who not only wrote beautiful essays, but contributed their essays to the project. Nobody accepted any fees. So, thank you.